Good morning. We continue with exposition of 1 Peter and today we turn our focus chapter 4 verses 1 to 11. Let us pray as we dig in. We praise you Lord that you suffered in your body for us not only to set an example for us as sojourners but also to save us from our sin. Thank you that in you we have a new identity and this new life. Lord, as we sit under your word this morning, we pray that you will silence every noise around us and help us sustain a hearing ear. We ask these things in your name and for your glory. Amen. If you knew the word would end in 24 hours, how would you spend your last day on earth? How would you spend your last day on earth if it was ending in the next 24 hours? How does it look like to stand fast in the true grace of God in the last days? We have seen that the aim of Peter's letter is to encourage his audience to stand fast in the true grace of God amidst suffering. He achieves this by reminding his audience about their true identity in Christ, their Christian behavior, and their Christian mandate. Their new blood boat identity is the motivation to endure suffering, to live godly lives, and to accomplish their mandate. In this section, chapter 4, 1 to 11, Peter continues to instruct his audience how to stand fast in the true grace of God on how they live in the end times, both in the unbelieving word, but also in the church as God's community. Let us read this text, then we will dig right in. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 1 to 11. I'm reading from NIV. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourself also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what Pagan chose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standard in regard to their body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind, so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sin. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in various forms. If anyone speak, they should do so as one who speaks the very word of God. If anyone serves, they should do so in the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. We look at this section under two divisions. One, live for the will of God, not for human desires. And two, love and serve one another for God's glory. Love and serve one another for God's glory. One, live for the will of God and not human desires. 
On our last sermon, we saw from one, from verses 1 of chapter 4, how the elect in exile should arm themselves with the same attitude as of Christ who suffered in his body. This attitude would help them to endure suffering even for doing good as we saw in chapter 3, verses 13 to 20. This verse not only gives us an example to emulate in suffering, but it tells us the result of suffering in the body, that is, being done with sin or ceasing to sin. Look down with me at verse 1. Therefore, Christ suffered in his body. Sorry, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, Arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. Note that whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. This suffering in the body is not just enduring pain, but dying, as we saw in verse 18 of chapter 3, that Christ suffered once for sin referring to his death. In other words, Christ died once for sin. The point therefore here is those who have died in the body with Christ have ceased to sin. They live for the will of God and not for human desires. For verse 2 leads, as a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. Because of what has happened to them, that they have died in the body with Christ, Peter's audience should no longer live to satisfy the desires of their flesh, but rather to live for the will of God, to live the life that pleases God. Note in verses 3 that the elect exile had once lived for human desires, like pagans living in every kind of sin, living in debauchery and lust and drunkenness and detestable sins. But now that they have died to this sin, they ought not to live in this way, but to live in a way that praises God. This different lifestyle of praising God will not go unnoticed by the pagans and it will cause suffering to the Christians. The pagans will heap abuses on them. Holy living, a life that praises God, will result in opposition and suffering from the pagan world. But here is the good news that the pagans will be judged by God who judges the living and the dead. And the gospel has been preached to everyone, even to the ones that are dead, so that during judgment there's none with any excuse. How does standing fast in the true grace of God in the unbelieving word full of pagans look like? It is living for the will of God, not for the desires of the flesh. It is leaving behind every kind of past sins and living a new life. It is living according to God in regard to the Spirit. But the second way is to love and serve one another for God's glory. Verses 7 to 11. Standing fast in the true grace of God is not only something for the Christian to do out there among the unbelieving pagans, but also in the church among themselves as God's community. Here, yeah? in verses 7 to 11, Peter exhorts his audience to stand fast in the true grace of God by loving and serving one another. 
he reminds them that the end of all being is near. Verse 7. This means that the coming salvation is at hand. That they are about to receive the glorious inheritance that is kept in heaven for them. As we saw from chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. In light of this truth, that Christ is coming back, this is how Christian should live. One is that they should be alert and sober so that they will pray. Verse 7. The danger for this exiled Christian, as we have said over and over again, is that they can compromise their faith or conform to the way of life of their opponents. Peter, therefore, reminds them to be sober and alert, to be focused, and in doing so, to pray. But also is to love each other deeply. Verses 8. This is the second time we are coming across this imperative. We saw in chapter 1, verses 22, that Christian ought to love each other sincerely and deeply. Remember, we said that the motivation to love each other deeply is a fact that Christians in exile are purified by God. Here again, Peter reminds them of this imperative, love each other deeply. As a family of believers, love each other because love covers a multitude of sin. This does not mean that love allows sins to thrive among the people of God. But rather, loving each other and extending grace to each other help to spur one another toward godliness and let me start again. Love that covers over a multitude of sin does not mean that it allows sin to thrive amongst God's people. But loving each other help in extending grace to one another, help inspiring one another toward godliness, and help them to bear with one another. Instead of stripping each other naked, Christians that love one another, bears with one another, and encourage each other in the pilgrimage. But another thing the family of believers should do as they look forward to the coming of Christ and as a way of standing fast in the true grace of God is to offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Verses 9. We have previously established that the true family of a Christian in exile is not the biological family he is born in, but the church he is saved into. Because of this, Christians should be hospitable. They should open their homes for each other. They should share their lives with one another. And they should take care of each other needs without grumbling. Peter, Call these people, the Christians in exile, to serve one another. Verses 10. Everyone in a church community is gifted and gifted differently. Note that gifts are God's grace that he has entrusted to his people. As verse 10 says, that each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Peter categorizes God's gift into two broad categories, one speaking and two serving. And he says, 
If anyone speak, they should speak as they are speaking the very word of God. Verses 10. This applies both to those who are gifted and are called to proclaim the word of God to the church, but also to the church members as they speak the word of God with each other amongst themselves. As they do so, they should do it and they are speaking the very word of God. Those who are gifted to serve, they should serve with the strength that God provides. God has gifted every Christian not for themselves, but for the sake of one another. No one is gifted to serve himself, but rather gifts are for the common good of the church. Note that, the, that above all, God's gift and Christian serving each other is for the glory and the praise of God through Jesus. That God's gift and Christian serving each other, the end goal is for the glory and praise of God himself. Christian should serve one another and in doing so, God is glorified forever and ever. In summary, through the union with Christ, believers share not only in Christ's suffering, but also in his victory over sin. They have broken with a sinful past and now live according to God in regard to the Spirit. In other words, they live not for human passions, but for the will of God, remembering that the end will come soon. Believers should continue to love and to serve one another all to the glory of God. Friends, brothers and sisters, how do we apply this? How? Do you apply this? Two ways. One, live for God, not for self. The call for us is not different today. Just as the Christian in the first century were living among the Roman pagan community, we too are living in equally and even more ungodly community. And just as they had died with Christ, so we too have. How then do we live here? We are to die to self. We are to leave behind every kind of a former sin and lifestyle. We are to kill every kind of human desires and to praise God in the way we live. These look differently in specific areas in every individual life. We are to kill every kind of sin that we are struggling with. Killing sin is every Christian duty. Friends, our sinful nature won't otherwise. Our sinful nature won't to indulge in every kind of sin. But we have died to this in Christ. Daily putting to death the old nature with its desires. Daily reminding ourselves of who we have become in Christ. And living in accordance with our new identity is how we stand fast in the true grace of God. The second application is love and serve. Do you love your Christian brothers and sisters? Are you concerned about their welfare? How do you use your gifts? Friends, we have obligation towards each other. 
Christianity is not a private religion. Christ is not just a personal savior. We are born again into a community of believers. We are therefore to live a life of love, deep, sincere love towards each other. We are to self selflessly serve one another with all humility. The danger we face is one, to want to be private Christians, but two, is to think that we are better Christians because we are gifted, especially those with conspicuous gifts. We forget that we are just God's stewards of this gift and he has entrusted them to us not for our own selfish use but to serve his church and for his glory therefore the question is are you diligently serving with your gifts at your placement are you a good steward of what the lord has put on you brothers and sisters Standing fast in the true grace of God look like not only killing every kind of sin, living a new life in Christ, but being sober and alert and serving and loving each other. O oh Lord, we glorify you and we praise you for your goodness and mercies to us. Thank you that you died, and therefore we died with you. Thank the Lord, we have become victorious of our sins. Therefore, we pray that you'd help us to live a life that is worthy of you, to praise you, and not to live for human passion. Would you help us to love each other, to serve you, and to serve one another with the gifts that you have entrusted us. Oh, may these truths not just remain to be head knowledge, but they, but may they impact how we live every day of our lives. We ask these things in your name, our Savior and Lord. Amen.